UCLA has been on the field here for a few days. What uh, is Chip trying to get accomplished? You know, there's there's a lot of question marks, which you would expect coming off a three and nine season. Um, obviously, they they've had a lot of attrition, as we noted in, uh, in our column yesterday at Last Word on College Football. Thirty five players gone since Chip Kelly took over in December of 2017. Some of them are grad transfers, and as you and I have, have discussed repeatedly, grad level student athletes don't stay where they currently are. They've got one last chance to to uh, measure their own value somewhere else, and they generally take it and kind of define their own destiny one last time in college, and they leave. So UCLA's had a few of those. They've had a couple of early departures for the NFL. They've had a couple of medical retirements, one recently. Um, and uh, then they've got people who have just left with, with uh, either of their own volition or chips. And a couple of them, you know, a couple of them are a little bit interesting that, that we can get into when we're talking about the different positions. But uh, you lose 35 players. You sign a recruiting class that is less than the maximum allowed. And you lose those players, you get the graduation, and you're looking at a spring camp roster of about 70 players, which is generally what you get when, uh, you know, you're on probation and you've got scholarship reductions. And so there is uh, there are some depth questions. There are some positions where they are very well stocked, but others where the depth is razor thin. And so Chip's got to kind of, see what he's got in the trenches, uh, you know, at, at the second and third levels at those positions. So the, the player that gets uh, the most scrutiny is, of course, the quarterback position. And with a star in the making, possibly in Dorian Thompson Robinson, uh, we will start there in regards to your thoughts about uh, what you saw last year, what uh, you expect to see this spring and how steep the competition is going to be for him. Well, here's here's the challenge with the quarterback position, and and you know, look, we we've been to camp. Uh, they've been in pads twice so far this spring, and Dorian Thompson Robinson has looked better than he did last year. But it is the expected improvement from a freshman who'd never played in college and who was splitting time because of injuries, who is now the ordained leader at the position going into spring camp. Um, he has improved. His, his delivery in the pocket is a little bit quicker. His throws are coming a little bit quicker. His decision-making through the progressions seems to come a little bit more, not to be redundant, but it's a little bit more decisive. Um, he doesn't look as, as lost, you know, going through the progressions as he did at times last year. So he looks significantly better in camp. Um, he's running out of the pocket with a little bit more ease. All of those things are good. All of those things bode well for UCLA. Here's the challenge. You are one DTR sprained ankle away from disaster. And I say that with no disrespect to the other quarterbacks, but what you have right now behind him is Austin Burton, who this is his second camp. He's never taken a college snap in a game. Um, he looks he looks adequate, but he looks like it's his first time really taking significant snaps with the second string, with the twos as they call them, um, because his decision making is slower in the pocket, significantly so. The ability to throw on the run has yet to be proven in a consistent basis. Uh, when he when he makes the decision to leave the pocket, it is specifically to run. It is not to still keep your eyes downfield and look for other options. It is specifically I'm tucking, I'm running, plays over. Um, you know, so they've got some significant challenges there. Um, you know, they've got the freshman Chase Griffin, who uh, you know from Texas, who was the Gatorade player of the year down there. He is not medically cleared to throw. He's got an injury. So he's mimicking plays in camp, but it is unlikely he will see any significant action in camp, if any at all. So you've got some real challenges at the quarterback position. I think you and I had talked about it after National Signing Day in February 
one of the key elements missing was getting an experienced junior college transfer or grad transfer quarterback. Now, that's not to say that possibility that doesn't still exist. Uh, you know, you and I see the transfer portals and know that, you know, players are coming and going like it's a 7-Eleven store right now. But there is a lack of viable experience behind DTR. And with an offensive line that is very, very, very thin in depth, you're, you're running a pretty big risk right now. DTR looks terrific so far. Significantly improved. No question about it. Question is what happens what happens after that? What's next? We got uh, Tony Syracuse on the line from last word on college football to talk UCLA with the Bruins in camp under Chip Kelly in season number two. So I will liken the management of the roster and the number of scholarships available and uh, the number filled to a general manager in professional sports that has to weigh uh, the personnel and the talent on the roster versus what they uh, they can afford in regards to the cap or the limitations of the ownership and what they're given to spend. And so how does a head football coach at that level with the resources that he has get himself into a predicament or is this something that he inherited and he needs a couple of years to work himself out of? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a cop out answer and say it's a little bit of both. Um, Look, some of the players that he inherited weren't suited for his program, for what he wanted to run, what he wanted to do. Some of them were not suited for the type of structure and discipline that he wanted to instill in in the program. Um, Some of the players who have left were players who were suspended once or even twice, and he made it clear at that point there wasn't going to be a next time. There wasn't going to be a third time. So there was really no place for them at that point. Um, some of them left because they weren't getting the playing time they wanted. Um, there's one, one young man who it's, it's turned into a, a little bit of an interesting sidebar of a story. Mike Juarez, who is a highly touted uh, linebacker coming out of high school a few years ago here locally in Southern California. He missed his first year because... He had some personal family issues that he needed time to resolve. And um, it was a struggle with Jim Moore. Jim Moore actually recommended that he get professional help and so on to get through it. And, you know, I nobody really knows how far that delved into. But Mika came back, um, but has suffered through a lot of injuries. And this last year, in 2018, he saw the field a handful of games, but again, Injuries, concussion, maybe even two, depends on who you want to listen to. The UCLA UCLA issued a medical retirement announcement for him as well as defensive lineman uh, Rick Wade. And Wade acknowledged that that was the case. He was having to give up football because of a neck injury that was going to require surgery. He was done. It's a significant loss for UCLA. Mike Juarez, however, refuted UCLA's stance. UCLA, of course, is not going to go specific into a player's injuries. Uh, a lot of colleges won't, and, and Chip Kelly won't, and the school won't, especially someone who has been advised to medically retire. There are uh, privacy issues, and it's just not something UCLA wants to delve into. Mike Juarez, however, did not shy away from it last week. He went public on his social media pages and acknowledged that the UCLA doctors advised him to medically retire and they will not clear him for this upcoming season. So he's not medically retiring. He's putting his name in the transfer portal and going to another school because he considered their their medical opinion bupkis, to put it politely. Uh, so there, 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 there are these, there's Jalen Phillips who, you know, was a prized five-star defensive end recruit a few years ago, has played 10 games over the last two years total because of injuries, is advised to medically retire and acknowledges he's likely to medical medically retire. And two weeks later, his name shows up in the transfer portal and he's at Miami now. So there, there, there's some weirdness about some of the departures. Some of them are just standard departures. You don't have a place here. 
I don't like playing for you. We're going to part ways. Some of these are just, there's a few of them that are just go to being a little weird, a little hinky. And so it messes with the depth. There are a few positions where UCLA has a treasure trove of talent. They are miles deep at running back. Um, they, they've got, you know, Joshua Kelly, you know, for a moment or two tinkered with the idea of putting his name in for the NFL draft. He came back. They had a lot of talent coming back anyway with Kashmir Allen and Martel Irby, but you get a thousand yard rusher returning to the lineup for his senior season. And that is just huge. Um, so, you know, they've got some good young players coming in also with Keegan Jones and, and so forth. So they, they are very, very deep at running back. They're very deep at wide receiver. Uh, Theo Howard came back. I got to tell you, he's, he's – uh, if you haven't watched UCLA or you haven't familiarized yourself with UCLA that much, this is a guy who deserves your attention. He was routinely in Jim Mora's doghouse his freshman year. Elite speed, really good hands, constantly in Mora's doghouse. A little bit more playing time his sophomore year. Made a big impact in the USC game, taking on Iman Marshall one-on-one, -on -one, you know, beating him routinely in that game. Had a huge season last year with no drops the entire season. I mean, just great statistics. And decided to come back. UCLA loses Caleb Wilson, the tight end, who was kind of, every quarterback safety net, whether it was Wilton Spate or whether it was DTR, he was like the safety blanket for both quarterbacks. He's gone, but they are super deep at receiver. Uh, we're seeing Chase Cota, the sophomore, get a lot of time with the ones right now. And we're seeing a big impact from Kyle Phillips, uh, who played last year as a freshman, but probably going to see a lot more time this year. So, uh, Demetric Felton as well got got a lot of catches last year, and he's back. So very very deep at receiver and at tight end. Um, that offensive line is scary thin once again, like it was last year. Um, they lost Andre James to the NFL. Not sure losing them is that big of an impact. He wasn't. He didn't have a very good season last year as it is. Um, but they just don't have a lot of depth. They've got a couple of good freshmen coming in who won't be in until summer. And so you've got some issues there on, on that part of the offense. And again, we go back to what we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. When your season depends on protecting DTR and your offensive line is thin in depth, you don't have a lot of wiggle room. UCLA football was uh, spotlighted along with uh, USC on the uh, front page of the college football site at ESPN.com today. I, I ran through that article. Uh, didn't really give me anything that I didn't know concerning the state of the two programs, what the mood is, what the vibe, what the potential is, what the expectations are, and that they're both in this, this lull for different reasons. And uh, because of Chip Kelly's uh, track record and the hope that's entrusted in him being a bit different than uh, Clay Helton not living up to expectations of what the USC fan base would like to see there, two young quarterbacks in play, and, and the various reasons why, again, five wins and three wins these past two seasons, but a little bit more optimism on the UCLA side compared to what we saw uh, better play in November and, of course, a win over their arch rival versus USC. Disappointing after two big seasons and the offseason being a bit in turmoil. So your take on the comparison at this point? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. UCLA, the challenges are on the field and within the program itself specifically. There, there are Chip Kelly doubters on UCLA social media sites. There are plenty of them. I, I see them all the time. Folks, you know, kind enough to, to, to read the stuff at last word and comment and, and have some good give and take on, on Chip Kelly and whether he was, whether he is the right guy, was the right guy, what his recruiting issues are, the challenges with keeping the team together, things like that. Those are football-related issues. USC is having a bit of a public relations disaster with regards to football, with regards to the athletic program as a whole, 
you know, I mean, look, everybody knows the story yesterday with the Hollywood folks who were buying their kids way into college through athletic departments. The UCLA soccer coach got fired, uh, well, placed on leave, but he was arrested yesterday shortly before all of us showed up to watch spring football camp. He was arrested yesterday. Um, the USC associate athletic director, however, was taken away in handcuffs from her home yesterday. Look, they're both bad, no matter how you put it. This entire story is full of insanity at so many levels. But when you have a chief administrator, high-level administrator, doing the perp walk for taking bribes over this issue, that's a problem within the athletic department as a whole. When you have USC being part of the FBI investigation into the basketball slash shoe business slash AAU investigations at the same time this is going on, there's a challenge there. And then, as you pointed out, there's a whole lot of misgivings about Clay Helton to begin with. And there was the debacle with trying to hire Cliff Kingsbury in the offseason as the savior for uh, for the offense, as the new offensive coordinator. And, you know, he barely unpacked his box in his office before he was leaving to take over the Arizona Cardinals. And it took them another three, maybe four weeks to settle in on another offensive coordinator in, in Graham Harrell. So there's... If you're USC, you got to feel like you can't get out from under it right now. If you're UCLA, you're not happy with with the football program and what happened last year. But you you've you're hoping you're, you're hoping for something positive to come down. But the rest of the program, in terms of athletics, you've got a basketball coaching search, which you know. Is, was inevitable at some point. So the two programs really are in deep shadows. USC's got more of a structural within the administration issue. UCLA's got an on the field and on the court issue. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, you can join the uh, Voice of College Football Mark Rogers TV over on Patreon. We're going to be, uh, as of the first week of April, providing some exclusive content there. So we uh, would like for you to join our team there. The Amazon links are in the description section of any video to help build the channel as well. You don't need to buy the product, just use the link. Tony Saracusa joining us from Last Word on College Football to talk UCLA. And it's since I've extended this conversation across town to USC, let me broaden it all the way out to the Pac-12. Um, I have not watched much college basketball for the last 10 or 12 years, but by osmosis, based on where I work, I soak up a lot of um, vibes and talk and information and rankings and so forth. Uh, the Pac-12 is has been in the past uh, one of the great basketball conferences in the nation, of course. And it's not been a down year. It's been a da down handful of years for the Pac-12. And we're looking at, I believe, one or two teams from the Pac-12 making the NCAA tournament. And this has been the case with just two or three teams making it the past few years. I relate this to football because in your infinite wisdom, I'm asking, is there any connection between the football woes and the basketball woes in this conference? From a logistical standpoint, no. There is horrible recruiting. The Pac-12 basketball is horrific right now. I mean, Washington is viable. You're going to get two teams in, into the tournament, and that's probably one more team than the conference deserves. Um, we'll see how you know the conference tournament plays out this weekend and, and, and how that goes. Um, but it's, it's, it's terrible. The recruiting is terrible across the board. The... It's not just one or two teams that are suffering. UCLA did a great job recruiting, but had a coach that was was never a viable option from the moment he was hired. You've got challenges at USC as well. There's talent, but lack of coaching, and then there are other schools that have decent coaching with no talent. Now, having said that there's no connection, I'm going to draw a connection. There is one connective tissue that binds the challenges of football and the challenges of basketball 
and it is one Larry Scott. <laughs> the conference itself is mired in just uh, one. It goes from one nightmare to another. Uh, look, Larry Scott's in Las Vegas right now for the Pac-12 conference. And it got out that he's hanging out in a $7,500 a night hotel suite, guaranteed 24-7 butler service for a conference that can't even sell its own TV network to advertisers, that doesn't even have product clearance or, or, or audience clearance throughout its own region because it doesn't have direct TV or AT&T U-verse carrying it. You know, if, if you if you're a direct TV household, you got to find some back channel way to pick up stuff on the Pac-12 network. It's insane. It is absolutely insane. So, is there is there a logistical connection between the two? No. Is there a thread that should be binding them, but sort of gets thin and unravels? Yeah, it's Mr. Scott. I'll ask the same question then, and it's a hypothetical question, or it's not a hypothetical, it's a um, rhetorical question. It's the same question I ask myself most election years, presidential election years, thinking there are 330 million Americans, there are a lot of brilliant people out there, and I think, is, is this the best we can do? This is the most powerful <laughs> position in the country. <laughs> this is the best we can do. Can't we find some other people to run? Therefore, can't the Pac-12, I don't know what the, the job pays, but I got to think that there are some movers and shakers, for a cliched term, uh, that, that could do a much better job. Let me give you an idea of that. The job for a Pac-12 commissioner pays more than what the SEC commissioner and his top three assistants combined are getting paid. Really? Hey, yes. That is, I, I don't have the specific dollar figure, but yes, it was researched a couple weeks ago. There's a, uh, there's a newspaper up in Oregon that if you, if you do the Google search, you'll find it. They did a four piece investigation into Larry Scott, probably about two to three months ago outstanding work fabulous work about the finances about how he had to move from walnut uh california which is a nice little suburb in northern california just outside the bay area to move into san francisco because it's where all the movers and shakers and the tech industry are and he's got no tech support from any major company no major tech backing and he's paying four times the lease that he is because it's San Francisco, one of the most expensive cities in the Western Hemisphere. It's insane. And they're running the Pac-12 network out of there as well. So you've got all the studio space there, which, you know, you and I know as media people, that is expensive to run, you know, in the space you need to run viable studios. And you're doing it in the middle of high-priced San Francisco like that. The money that is being spent for a network that is going nowhere is insane. He, he had a life raft thrown out to him a few years ago by ESPN. They wanted a partnership. And the Pac-12 would maintain controlling financial interest. It was about a 55-45 split. But a partnership with ESPN, and he turned it down because he felt the Pac-12 network was better staying independent. How's that working for you, Larry? Seriously, how's that working for you? His pitch last summer at the Pac-12 Media Days was on how the Pac-12 network is geared for the future with all the cable cutters. And they're going to be the leader in 2023. And that network isn't going to survive until 2023 at the pace it's going. There's no way. So... Are there better people to take the job? Yeah. What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> Polish up your resume. Send it in. All right. We'll work on that. You. I nominate you. To the rescue. <laughs> I, I think it's one step away from commissioner of college football. That that would be my stepping stone. I've always wanted to be the commissioner of college football. We'll um, show our yeah. wares on the Pac-12. I guess I got to prove it somewhere. 
You got my vote. The Pac-12 is as good a proving ground as any. Tony Syracuse on the line talking to UCLA football, USC, and the Pac-12 tonight. We got to Tony stretching from coast to coast, uh, meaning from the, well, I, that made no sense, from border to border, let's say, from, from Canada to Mexico. Let's <laughs> let's go with that uh, distance uh, uh, range. All right, Tony. I think I've talked enough tonight. It's starting to all run together, but I uh, appreciate you stopping by to talk UCLA football. Glad to do it. Hey, one of these days we're going to take on your your ranking of Pac-12 coaches. I got. Oh you. yes. Well, we've got plenty of time to do that. So so we will. Uh, you you keep uh, your um, your your uh, debate points handy. I will. I will. And uh, we'll we'll go with that. All right, pal. All right, Tony. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good talking to you, Mark.